Good morning. morning. Welcome to the Unitarian Universalist Church of Buffalo. We are so happy you have chosen to be with us this morning. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Whether you have come from near or far, you are welcome in this space. And welcome to all who are joining us through YouTube. Hi, everybody. We are happy you are joining us. Everyone is welcome here, the young, the aged, and everyone in between. It does not matter who you love, only that you do love. You are all loved in this church. We are so happy that you are all here with us to join in worship and community. I am Charlene Montgomery. I am the worship associate today for Reverend Kathy. We thank our wonderful tech team for their contributions to make this service run so smoothly, and our music ministry, who fill our space with beauty. After the service, please join in fellowship in the church hall. We acknowledge that the ground upon which we meet rests on a people, original nations of this land, who continue to call for justice and self-determination. We are stewards of these grounds so that generations to come might enjoy its beauty. Now, just a couple of announcements. First, we're going to have Christine Slocum to talk briefly about the congregational meeting. Good morning. It is a delight to see you all. I am going to briefly summarize the congregational meeting. So if this sounds like the spoken version of bullet points, that's because it is. So first we discussed the budget. If I'm not mistaken, there's a copy in the office. If you're a member, you can take a look at that. If you have questions, they are welcomed. Um, We announced the capital campaign, which is a huge, Big deal, super exciting. Um, We will be raising lots and lots of money for the maintenance of this church into the future. So please keep this church in your heart and in your mind in the forefront of your generosity in the years moving forward. We elected new board members. And at this point, I would like to thank our outgoing board members for their service. So that's Bridget Evans, Michael Hill, and Bobby Withrow. They put a lot of hours heart, energy into this church, and thank you. I'm also trying to pretend I'm not nervous talking to you all right now, but (laughs) yeah. Yeah, they have done and they are continuing to do so much for this church, so like on behalf of the board, we're super grateful for it. Um, We elected three new board, well, four of us were elected. Uh, Denise DiPietro, who is upstairs teaching right now. Uh, Paul Zanoli, who you often see with a bass in his hand. Uh, Bill Park, who is our church historian, and um, I was also elected to fill the last two years of that term. After the church uh, congregational meeting, the board got together and we elected officers, and all of the officers are brand new. So uh, Thea Hassan, who I right over there, is our secretary. Paul Zanoli is our brand new treasurer. Kate Bell Schwade is the vice president, and I was elected president, though Kate and I are going to be sharing leadership roles. And that leads me to the next little bit. If you're new to us, um, there's no Unitarian Pope. We democratically choose our leaders, which, like, could you guys imagine? That would just not work at all. So there's times of maintenance and there's times of change, and we are entering a time of very exciting change. So there's the capital campaign for sustaining this building into the future, and we are also going to be embarking on the settled minister search. If you've been with us for a while as part of our community and participating in the ministries, we are so happy that you are here. If you would like to have a vote in this future of our church, you would need to become a formal member. That's signing the book, learning a bit about us, and making a formal financial pledge. I would invite you to consider it because this time, more than others, you would really be getting a say in the future of this wonderful, beautiful place. So thank you all. Um, If you have any questions, you can find me, any of the board members. The person standing next to you in the coffee hour is probably happy to talk about membership too. But thanks. Thank 
Thank you, Christine. And now we have Dr. Jesse Downs. Good morning, everyone. Um, good morning. <laughs> um, so if you love to sing, or if you've ever thought, hmm, maybe joining the choir could be fun, or rejoining the choir, I'm inviting you this week to come try us out for a week. Um, we're not trying you out. Everyone is welcome. So if you're just not sure if you can commit to it schedule-wise, I'm trying to encourage people that there's so many different ways to participate in the music ministry. And even coming to sing with us for just one week is one way that you could do that. So this week, we're going to be singing two really familiar tunes, Blackbird by the Beatles and Anthem by Leonard Cohen in choral arrangements. So if you can come join us, Thursday nights are our rehearsals, 7.30 to 945. I know that's kind of late for some people, so if you can only stay for half a rehearsal, that's okay too. And then we'll be performing those pieces um, in service next Sunday. So uh, yeah, come and sing with us. We'd love to see you. Thanks. I think that's enough announcements. Uh, <laughs> is this? Oh, just one other quick one. Um, <laughs> There is a reminder that after church today at 1215 in the sanctuary, there will be a free showing of I'm Not Your Negro, presented by the band book club. There's lots of good things happening in our church. Make sure you take those announcements home and hang them on your fridge. I know you don't, but do it anyway. And now let us greet your neighbor and greet those who you know well and those you don't. Was joyful. Um, good morning. It's good to be together again. I'm Reverend Kathy Harrington. I serve as the interim minister of this church. As um, Christine told you, this church will be in search for its new settled minister in the fall of 20... When is it? 2025. Right? Yeah. That's exciting. God, I'm so old. So I want to just want to talk about um, our amazing music director at the moment. And um, Soto Voce is doing uh, opera here, the, the um, magic flute. And I wanted you to know that they are offering a free dress rehearsal for music students. So if you have grandchildren or children or neighbors who are passionate about music, please let them know this is happening on Wednesday, February. 21st at 6, you can check the website. But um, I'm really proud that, um, that this church is offering such an incredible opportunity. New York City opera director and choreographer Emma Jaster said, if you break opera down into each of its parts, story, song, music, costumes, and dance, you will find yourself speaking the language of children. You are in an imaginative play at the grandest, most virtuosic level. 
Also, join us in the parish hall, not just for fellowship, but also food. As you well know, we have a resident chef. We're so lucky, Nate. Nate and Jarrell volunteer to do this every Sunday because Nate grew up in this church, and he remembers coffee hour being just absolutely magnificent. And I think um, I know that your children feel the same way. So also remember, tell them thank you. But there's a little box on the table that takes donations. The coffee hour food is funded only by donations. It's not in the budget line. So please be generous if you, if you stay to eat. Thank you. I'm not, you said no more announcements, didn't you? <laughs> I'm, I, well. That's okay. Thank you. These words are by the Reverend Maureen Kaloran, one of my favorite colleagues. Love is the aspiration, the spirit that moves and inspires this faith we share. Rightly understood, love can nurture our spirits and transform the world. May the flame of our chalice honor and embody the power and the blessing of the love that we need, the love that we give, and the love that we are challenged always to remember and to share. If there is to be peace in the world, there must be peace in the nations. And if there is to be peace in the nations, there must be peace in the cities. If there is to be peace in the cities, there must be peace in the neighborhoods. If there is to be peace in the neighborhoods, there must be peace in the home. If there is peace in the home, there must be peace in the heart. Please rise as you are willing or able and join in our chalice lighting words. We gather in loving community, creating a shared vision of compassion and dignity for all to radically transform the world in which we live. Please join in hymn number six, Just As Long As I Have Breath, found in your gray hymnal. Can come forward and also all of you young at heart who'd like to be a little bit closer.
morning, everyone. Look at you. It's so good to see you. I have a story for you. I don't know if any of you know of this story called The Invisible Boy by Trudy Ludwig. Can you, oops. Okay. All right. That's okay. All right. Can you see Brian, the invisible boy? Even Mrs. Carlotti has trouble noticing him in her classroom. She's too busy dealing with Nathan and Sophie. Nathan has problems with what Mrs. Carlotti calls volume control. He uses his outside voice inside too much. And Sophie whines and complains when she doesn't get her way. Nathan and Sophie take up a lot of space, and Brian doesn't. When the bell rings for recess, Micah and JT take turns choosing kids for their kickball teams. The best players get picked first, then the best friends of the best players, and then the friends of the best friends. And only Brian is left, still waiting and hoping. JT glances in Brian's direction and just as quickly looks away. We've got enough players for each team, he tells the others. Let's play ball. In the cafeteria, Madison and her friends talk about her birthday party. The rope swing over the pool was awesome, says JT. And so was the water slide, asks, adds Fiona. That was the best pool party ever. I'm so glad you guys had fun, said Madison. Everybody did except Brian. He wasn't invited. At choosing time, while the other kids play board games and read, Brian sits at his table and does what he loves to do best. He draws fire-breathing dragons, scaling tall buildings. And see that picture, that dragon is toasting his marshmallows. Space aliens locked in intergalactic battles and greedy pirates digging for treasure and superheroes with the power to make friends wherever they go. On Monday morning, Mrs. Carlotti introduces Justin, a new student, to the class. Brian smiles shyly at him. Some of the other kids sneak looks at Justin, trying to figure out if he's cool enough to be their friend. They haven't made up their minds yet. At lunch, Madison and JT watch Justin eat with chopsticks. What's that, says Madison, as she points at his food. It's bulgogi. Somebody know how to say that? Bulgogi. Bul what? Bulgogi. It's Korean barbecued beef. My grandma made it for me. It's really good. Do you want to try some? There's no way I'm going to eat bulgogi. And all the kids laugh. All of them, that is, except Brian. He sits there and wondering which is worse, being laughed at or feeling invisible. The next day when Justin goes to his cubby to put away his backpack, he notices a piece of paper with his name on it. Justin, I thought bul bulgogi looked really good. Brian, yum. At morning recess, Brian finds a piece of chalk on the ground and starts drawing away. You're Brian, right? Yeah, thanks for the note. Hey, Justin, Emilio calls from the tetherball court. You're up next. Sorry, I gotta go, says Justin. By the way, that's a real cool drawing, he adds, just before taking off. Back in class, Mrs. Carlotti asks the kids to team up in twos or threes for a special project. The kids scurry around the room to pair off, and Brian heads towards Justin. I'm already with Justin, says Emilio. Find someone else. Brian looks at the floor, wishing he could draw a hole there just to swallow him up. Justin says, Mrs. Carlotti said we can have up to three people in our group, and we're only two. Come on, Emilio, let him work with us. OK, I guess. Mrs. Carlotti gives the class directions for the project. Your assignment is work to work together to write a story about what you see in the photograph. Use your imagination and have fun. Whoa, cool, says Emilio. What kind of people do you think live in houses like that? I don't know, but I bet Brian could draw them to go with our story, says Justin. Brian smiles as he takes out his lucky pen. Wow, look at this. The crooked story we made up on the spot. Look at that story, narrator. Hi, I'm the narrator, and if you're part of the 
a narrator, I'll tell you oh, a, a tale. I don't know what that said. It's lunchtime again and Brian's least favorite part of the day. Another 20 long minutes of kids talking and laughing with everybody else but him. Brian, he hears someone shout, hey, Brian, over here. And Brian turns and sees Justin waving him over. Emilio nods at Brian and he makes room for him at the table. Do you notice that Brian is, doesn't look invisible anymore? Look, he's, yeah. Maybe, just maybe, Brian is not so invisible after all. The end. Yay! So tell me, what was your favorite part of the story? Oh, yes. When, when the, um, when Justin asked, is um, um, Brian to come and have a cookie? He was invited to uh, I liked it when uh, the dragon toasted the marshmallow. <laughs> When he was getting color, when he became seen. Yeah. I really liked the part uh, when he made the picture of him eating the. How do you say that? Lukogi. Oh my goodness. Um, I don't I... Huh? You don't want to. My favorite part was probably um, when he made the note. When he made the note? Mm -hmm. yeah. was, why do you think that was the note made, the note made Brian feel welcome? Yeah. My favorite part was when the dragon was toasting the marshmallow for the guy. <laughs> right. Oh, you do? You have a favorite part? No, I have a concern about the story, and I know a lot of people here are educators and involved with children. I'm concerned about the teacher's role, and it's something going back, I'm 71 years old, and it occurred when I was in school. Why is the teacher delegating to the more popular students, picking their teams and excluding other students in various activities throughout? The city of Buffalo is being sued right now for bullying, and for a child who committed suicide from being bullied, and all the alleged complicity. I'm interested in hearing from people who work with children about what role does the teacher have? Do we spoon feed and not let leadership develop? Or where does the teacher or social worker come in to prevent a situation like this? These kids should not have had to deal with it on their own. I agree, I agree with you. Thank you for that. So I have a question for you kids. Was there ever a time when you felt invisible? Yeah, that didn't feel good, did it? So what, do you, what can you do to help other children who fe might feel invisible? By trying to make friends with them. There you go. All right. Well, so you treat each other nicely. If you see somebody who's being bullied, you speak up, right? And who do you go to? The teacher, right? <laughs> Thank you. All right, now I'm gonna let you go with Miss Jessica to your classes, and we'll sing you out. week we take a good portion of our Sunday offering and give it away to a social justice cause outside our church walls. This month we are supporting the good work of Peace Prince of Western New York and today we have Christian Holdridge to speak to us about Peace Prince. Christian, I'm not sure where you, there you are.
Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for the welcome that I have received here. And thank you for your work supporting organizations like Peace Prints. Our job is to mitigate and disrupt the criminal justice system. Really concise sentence, not a very concise way to go about doing that because the criminal justice system is one of the most insidious and invisible systems here in our country. One of the things that I like to tell people to just sort of frame why we are doing what we are doing is that here in the US, the US population globally makes up only 4%. We're not very much of the entire world, but we hold 25% of the world's incarcerated population. That's terrible, that is, that is a very worrying, worrying statistic, and it only gets worse when you consider that our system is not reflective of our wider country demographic. It takes people who are marginalized, who are vulnerable, and it over-incarcerates and perpetually punishes those people. So at Peace Prints, what we do is we try to help people wherever they are in the cycle of incarceration, and we provide resources and tools and supports to meet them where they're at, to give them a chance at bettering themselves, at achieving independence. But more important than that, what we do is try to welcome them back into a community and to try and give them hope, to try and give them a support network that perhaps they didn't have the first time. Um, and so, I, I thank you for the chance to benefit from your offering, but also if you wanna get involved, I would love after the service to just share more about the different ways that we help individuals and how maybe if you have time or expertise or just passion, we could partner together to really help give people a second chance and to make the most of the second chance. And. Um, because I started with a very upsetting statistic, I will end with an uplifting one. Here in the US, um, our recidivism rate, meaning how many people who go through the criminal justice system that then end up right back there, is about 64%. Here in Erie County, it is 81.6, much worse. But at Peace Prince, and we have continued to grow and we serve approximately 1,500 people a year, only 9% of all of our clients ever experience further justice involvement. And that is really a testament to all of the community support and the individuals who come together to try and make a difference in the lives of the people we serve and to show them that there is a community who is excited to welcome them back, not as ex-offenders, but as the loved ones, as the parents, as the children, aunts, uncles, neighbors, employees, all of the remarkable, incredible people that our clients are. So thank you for this opportunity, and I hope to chat more later after the service. Thank you. Thank you, Christian. That's such an important ministry. To support our Share the Plate ministry, you can drop a check or cash in the offering plate. You can use PayPal by going to our website, and you can send a check to the church through the mail, or you can arrange a regular automatic deposit with your bank. If your check is a gift to our Share the Plate ministry, please write Share on the memo line, and it will be shared between Peace Prince of Western New York and the church operating budget. If yours is a welcome gift to our congregation, please write Pledge 2024 on the memo line. Either way, please write UUCB on the important line. In this time of exciting transition, let us give generously to support our church and its wide concerns.
Ever since I've been here, I've been really jealous that y'all get to see them sing, and I have to sit back there, so that's why. But I didn't realize they were going to stay here. Okay. In the center of our service and in the center of our lives, let us pause to honor the silences of the world. Open our hearts to the place of quiet, to the silent prayer for the healing of pain, and the soft, gentle coming of love. I'll begin our time of centering with a prayer written by Reverend Dr. Davidson Lohr. We pray not to something, but from something, to which we must give voice. Not to escape our life, but to focus it. Not to relinquish our mind, but to replenish our soul. We pray that we may live with honesty, that we can accept who we are and admit who we are not. That we don't become so deafened by pride and fear that we ignore the still, small voices within us that could lead us out of darkness. We pray that we can live with trust and openness to those people, those experiences, those transformations that can save us from narrowness and despair. And we pray on behalf of these hopes with an open heart and honest soul and a grateful reverence for the life which has been given to us. Amen. This morning we hold in our hearts Robin Harris, who is coping with new health challenges. Please think of her this week as she navigates this new life. And now let us fill our, this space, this sacred space, with the names of the loved ones we hold close in our hearts this morning, some suffering in sorrow and some suffering in celebrating in joy. May our hearts embrace them. The breath of nature is upon us, the spirit of life is within us, and the community of love is around us. So be it, blessed be, and let the church say, Amen. Amen. Thank you. 
The reading this morning is taken from a book called The Spirituality of Imperfection by Kurtz and Ketchum. Time before time, when the world was young, two brothers shared a field and a mill. Each night, they divided evenly the grain they had ground together during the day. Now, as it happened, one of the brothers lived alone. The other had a wife and a large family. One day, the single brother thought to himself, it isn't really fair that we divide the grain evenly. I have only myself to care for, but my brother has children to feed. So each night, he secretly took some of his grain to his brother's granary to see that he was never without. But the married brother said to himself one day, It isn't really fair that we divide the grain evenly, because I have children to provide for me in my old age, but my brother has no one. What will he do when he is old? So every night he secretly took some of his grain to his brother's granary. As a result, both of them always found their supply of grain mysteriously replenished each morning. Then, one night, the brothers met each other halfway between their two houses, and they suddenly realized what had been happening and embraced each other in love. The story is that God witnessed their meeting and proclaimed, this is a holy place, a place of love. And here it is that my temple shall be built. And so it was. The holy place where God is made known is the place where human beings discover each other in love. Well, that's a lovely story, isn't it? But don't you think those brothers might have saved themselves some time <laughs> and a little worry and maybe gotten a little more sleep had they communicated a little better with one another? <laughs> Perhaps sitting around the kitchen table and talking and listening to one another, sharing their feelings. Why is it so hard for us to do this? Alan Jones says we need to be known. The knowledge of being known is called love. Parker Palmer says, if we want to support each other's inner lives, we must remember a simple truth. The human soul does not want to be fixed. It simply wants to be seen and heard. Margaret Wheatley, I believe we can change the world if we start listening to one another again. Simple, truthful conversations where we have a chance to speak, where we feel heard, and we each listen well. Physician and author Rachel Naomi Remen offers wisdom on the power of listening. She says, I suspect the most basic and powerful way to connect to another person is to listen, just to listen. And perhaps the most important thing we ever give each other is attention. When people are talking, there's no need to do anything but to receive them. Another huge mistake that we tend to make in life is to fail to listen to ourselves. Parker Palmer wrote a wonderful little book called Let Your Life Speak. He addresses the human tendency to succumb, succumb to the expectations of others and fail to listen to our life, what our life is telling us, and trying to understand and find our true vocation. The word vocation is rooted in Latin for voice. It means a calling that we hear, not advice that we get from others, but the still small voice within. May Sarton wrote a poem about this journey of, of uh, hearing your own voice. She wrote, now I become myself. It's taken time, many years and places. I've been dissolved and shaken, worn other people's faces. 
run madly as if time were there, terribly old, crying, a warning, hurry, hurry, you'll be dead before, what, before you reach morning? Or the end of the poem is clear? Boy, I can relate to that sense of urgency. Hurry, hurry, you must hurry. Hurry where? I don't know, but I'm weary from putting this pressure on myself when I was young, in my 20s. I thought I was running out of time. <laughs> I had so much to do. I was raising kids, would I ever get a chance? So Rachel Naomi Roman is, Rachel Naomi Roman, Raymond, why am I tongue-tied? She is famous for her books, Kitchen Table Wisdom and My Grandfather's Blessing. The wisdom she gained from her grandfather really helped her in her job as a physician. She refers to him as a flaming mystic, but he was a student of the Kabbalah, the Jewish mysticism that teaches that there is a divine spark that resides in each of us. The story of the birthday of the world was her fourth birthday present her grandfather gave to her. It's called the story of Takun Alom. In the beginning, there was only darkness, the Ein Sof, the source of life. And then in the course of history, at a moment in time, this world of a thousand, thousand things emerged from the heart of the holy darkness as a great ray of light. And then perhaps, because this is a Jewish story, there was an accident. And the vessels containing the light of the world, the wholeness of the world broke. And, the, and it broke the wholeness of the world, the light of the world was scattered into a thousand, thousand fragments of light and they fell all over into the vents and people where they remain deeply hidden to this day. According to Remen's grandfather, the whole human race is a response to this accident. We are here because we are born with the capacity to find the hidden light in all events and all people. To lift it up and to make it visible in the world again and to restore the innate wholeness of the world. Those already born and those not yet born. And this is called tikkun olam. And we are the healers of the world. And it's not necessarily healing the world by making a huge difference. It's healing the world by making the world around you touch that world with your healing, your light. Shine your light. This is our power. The tradition of the Kabbalah teaches that God is not a noun, not a being, certainly not a he. God is the appropriate way to think of God, Rabbi David Cooper says, is as a verb, and to maybe change the word God to Godding. With a spark of divine in each of us, we are invited to co-create with life and to live our lives with that divine process in our everyday experience. Ralph Waldo Emerson echoes this. He wrote of inner wisdom, within us is the soul of the whole, the wise silence, the universal beauty, to which every part and particle is equally related, the eternal one. And when it breaks through our intellect, it is genius. When it breaks through our will, it is virtue. And when it flows through our affections, it is love. Whatever you call the uh, God or Godding, love, divine, wisdom, Buddha seed, still small voice, nature, we, can access, we cannot access this gift if we don't pause enough to listen to each other and to our own lives, it is possible to live an entire lifetime and miss your life. Remen tells a story about when she was in medical school, she attended a retirement dinner of a faculty member. He was in his 70s. He, he had won many, many awards, professional awards. He was well known and respected for his research, his contributions to medical science. People came from all over the world to honor him. The talk he gave was memorable, and with a characteristic brilliance, he summarized the, pro the progress of medical science in the 50 years since he had become a physician. Integrating into it a stunning synthesis, she writes, and pointing to the directions of future research. Later in the evening, a group of medical students wanted to speak to him and offer their congratulations and admiration, and he was gracious. One of them asked him if he had any words for them at the beginning of their careers, any words of wisdom that he thought they should know, and he hesitated. And then he told us, 
Despite his professional success and recognition, he felt he knew nothing more about life now than he had at the beginning, that he was no wiser. His face became withdrawn and even sad. It slipped through my fingers, he said. Ramon said, none of us understood what he meant. Talking about it afterwards, we thought maybe it was modesty, or perhaps he had at last become senile. And she writes, almost 30 years later, I understand, and my heart goes out to him. So we need to listen to one another, but real stories take time, and our lives are too full sometimes to sit around that kitchen table to listen and tell our stories. We've often lost the, reflect, the art of reflecting, and when we fail to reflect on our experiences, we lose our stories. It can slip through our fingers. We can be so preoccupied with getting our jobs done, building a career, solving problems, that we miss the meaning. We miss, we miss the whole thing. A while ago, there was a television commercial, many, many years ago, where there was a father sitting at the kitchen table eating toast and reading the newspaper, drinking coffee. And around him, his wife was packing lunches, feeding children. They were all eating and scrambling, and it was chaos, actually. It was mayhem. And then the kids were out the door, and his wife's leaning against the kitchen sink going, <sighs> like this. And he looks over his newspaper, and he goes, are the kids up yet? <laughs> I had to laugh. <laughs> I think it's better. I know that my sons don't behave that way. They are very helpful and things have improved. Working couples need one another to be partners in the family tasks. But we do tune out people. We tune out others. How much time do we spend with, on our devices? How many times do you go out to dinner and you see families sitting around the table looking at their phones and not talking to one another? Raman says, we have, what we have is each other. This is true, and yet we don't live there. My granddaughter spent summers with me in Lettington, Michigan when she was growing up. I remember our first summer, we had a lot of fun together, but not nearly as much as I hoped. I had fantasies of teaching her to be a master baker by the end of the summer. But we never got around to baking a single loaf of bread. I don't know how it happened. Life happened. There was a death in the church. I was busy writing sermons. There was a big wedding I was really nervous about. My mother had taught Abby to knit, but she was still kind of a novice. Her, her first project was to wit, knit um, arm warmers for her friend who lives in Texas because they need arm warmers in Texas. <laughs> So she'd reached this place where she needed to do the ribbing stitch. And the ribbing, if you do ribbing, you have to know how to knit, but you also have to know the purl stitch, which she didn't know. So I got her started with a few rows to demonstrate, and it wasn't long before she was like, another Grammy, I need help. So I didn't know what to do. I, I said, Abby, I can help you, but not right now. Tomorrow I can help you, because it was 8 o'clock, my sermon wasn't done. Disappointing your grandchildren is even more painful than disappointing your own children. And I don't understand that, but it's true. So I took her over to my mother's apartment, God bless her, and she had a knitting lesson and spent the night, and my house felt very empty and quiet. I felt heavy with regret. I was writing a sermon about letting your life slip through your fingers. And I recognized myself. I spent the rest of that summer enjoying the process of precious time with my granddaughter, going to the beach, making sandcastles, riding bikes, eating ice cream, flying kites, going to the movies. What are the things that are robbing you of your life? Think about that. Dr. Carl Pilmer interviewed over 1,000 older Americans for his book, 30 Lessons for Living because he believed that we can learn a lot from our elders. As he put it, anyone who makes it past their 60s, 70s, has, has beyond, or beyond has experienced tragedy of one kind or another. And this indeed is a fundamental source of elder wisdom and reason why we should attend to what they have to tell us. 
They have experiential knowledge. They have become experts in walking a balance between accepting loss and maintaining an awareness of life's joy and pleasures. The result of his research is that elders overwhelmingly believe that each of us can choose to be happier and that we can do so in the face of painful events that accompany the process of living. Lots of unpleasant things are gonna happen and we have to learn to breathe and move on and we can make a conscious decision each day to embrace a positive attitude. And more important wisdom that the elders shared was worrying. I don't, none of you worry, do you? I was up for three hours in the night worrying last night. James Huang, 87, put it this way. Why, I asked myself, what possible difference could it make if I kept my mind on every little thing that might go wrong when I realized that it would make no difference at all? So he said, my le life lesson is this. Turn yourself from frittering away the day worrying about what comes next and let everything else you do that you love and enjoy move in. The experts worry that... At, Experts see worry as a crippling feature of our daily existence. There was once a sign on a church, in front of a church. There's a lot of church bloopers. This one said, don't let worry kill you. Let the church help. <laughs> church blo bulletin bloopers are hilarious. You should look them up. And when I heard that... <laughs> When I heard that Nate was making hot dogs and baked beans for coffee hour this morning, I was reminded of another church blooper, and I probably will get fired for this, but there it goes. There will be a baked bean supper next Sunday at 6 p.m., music to follow. <laughs> I just wanted to see if you all were still awake. So I have a story, too, about worrying. I had a, when I was a hairdresser, I had a client who um, every summer they went to Hilton Head as a family, and her mother was a horrible worrier. Worry, worry, worry. So every summer they'd head out for this two-week vacation, load the car, pile in, drive about 45 minutes south to the beach, and inevitably her mother would yell, oh no, I've left the iron on, turn around. Everyone would groan, and her father would turn around, and they'd go home. Of course, the iron wasn't on. Have you ever done that? I think I've done that a few times. So finally, it all ended. The summer she told me this story. Her father, um, when, she, when they were halfway to Hilton Head, her mother cried, I've left the iron on. He slammed on the brakes, got out of the car, walked around the car, and they all sat in silence thinking, He's finally snapped. He's just going to leave us here. Then they heard the trunk open. They sat in frightened silence. They hit slam shut, and his father returned to the car, put the iron in his wife's lap, and <laughs> smiled all the way to Hilton Head. <laughs> so what's the moral of this story? Acceptance is the anecdote to worry. Pilama writes, life is short. We have to be open-minded, very open-minded, and we learn to accept instead of worrying, that, and learn to accept and accept instead of worrying. The key characteristic of worry, according to scientists who study it, is that it takes place in the absence of actual stressors, right? We worry before anything happens. So this kind of worry ruminating about the bad things that may happen is really not productive, and it robs you. Your life will slip through your fingers. So here's your refrigerator list. Time is of the essence. Live as though life is short because it is. The point is not to be depressed by this knowledge, but to act on it, making sure to do the important things now. Happiness is a choice, not a condition. Time spent worrying is time wasted. Think small. Think small. Stop worrying. When it comes time to make the most of your life, think small. Attune yourself to simple daily pleasure, pleasures and learn to savor them now. And have faith. A faith life promotes well-being and being a part of a religious community offers unique support during life crises. But how and what you worship is up to you. I want to leave you with a final piece of advice, the expert's wisdom. The psalmist says it clearly. 
So teach us to number our days that we may apply our hearts unto wisdom. The wisdom of tikkun olam teaches us that we are all healers of the world, and, but it's not about healing the world by making a huge difference. It's about going smaller, touching the lives around you, listening to one another heart to heart. For the holy place where God is made known is the place where human beings discover each other in love. May it be so. Blessed be. Please rise and body your spirit and join me in singing hymn number 18, What Wondrous Love. Please remain standing and join in our extinguishing the chalice. As we extinguish the flame of this chalice, may we carry its light with us into the world in the power of peace, faith, justice, and love. And may the love that overcomes all differences, which heals all wounds, which puts flight to all fears, which reconciles all who are separated, be in and among us now and always. May it be so. Blessed be.